time of Lent. He spoke of the fact that the Heavenly Father has created an individualized kingdom for each one of us. The issue then is whether we wish to bring our kingdom under his kingdom or rule it on our own. Do we live in a kingdom of our own? Absolutely. When you think about it, we each develop in our minds a kingdom that is ruled by certain assumptions about life, certain beliefs, and certain rules of conduct. This, of course, can vary enormously. It can vary with our DNA, with our culture, our family background, our economic status, and the kinds of nurturing that we received as a child while we were developing. The ruler of this kingdom is our God-given will, the ability to make choices, the awesome decision maker that the many scientists that are studying the brain have yet to identify. They haven't found the will yet. Let's take a very simple example of this personal kingdom of ours. Driving a car. What are the rules of the road? I can attest that they certainly vary from country to country and from even state to state. It's very different driving in Portland than it is driving in LA. But if you are a normal person, you realize that you need to obey the rules and laws of driving or there will be chaos. So we give driving lessons and we take driving tests and we issue licenses and permits for that privilege of driving a car in California. As drivers, we submit to a code of laws and behavior. That is, it is accepted as part of our personal kingdom. But there are some who take the road and they, they have pride in flaunting the laws. They are usually young males in hot cars. I can remember several years ago when I lived in Westwood. I was stopped at the, spot, at the stoplight at one of the busiest crossroads in all of LA, the corner of Wilshire and Westwood, many lanes in both directions. Now, a young man pulls up next to me in the lane that is turning left. He is revving a hot car, a Ferrari. Now, let me explain that at that time there was no left turn signal at that intersection. Now, there is. So those turning left had to wait for a break in the oncoming traffic, but not this young man. The instant that the light turned green, he shot across the intersection in front of all the oncoming cars. Fortunately for all concerned, he made it without incident. In his kingdom, he was above obeying the normal rules of the road. As we know, there is something about power that gives a person the feeling that they are above the law. The wealthy often fall into this type of thinking. That is why Jesus said it was so hard for them to get into God's kingdom. In their own kingdom, they have so much power that they don't think that they need God at all. I'm going to tell you just an incidental story here. When we moved to Westwood, we had never lived in such a wealthy neighborhood before. It was a revelation to me. We lived on Beverly Glen Boulevard, a little north of Wilshire. Now, that particular street is a main entry to Bel Air, 
which as you know has incredible wealth. So that the cars which went up and down our street were spectacular. One evening shortly after we had arrived, I saw my children all sitting out on our front stoop with a pad of paper. They were making a survey of the cars that were going by. It was pretty spectacular. Bentleys, Rolls Royces, Maseratis, you name it. There was a big cheer when a Stutz Bearcat went by in all of its rolling glory. President Reagan's home in Bel Air um, was, of course, up, one up that street, and then at the other end of the same street was Century City, where he had his presidential office. So when he was in town, we often had to have the street shut down while his entourage would go by. It was all, as I said, quite an education to me. As I, I came to believe, the wealthy live in a very special kingdom. But I'm arguing today that God is inviting us to bring our kingdom under his kingdom, his governance, his rule. By the way, the very word for kingdom can also be translated governance, rule, or reign. So I like to think that I have handed the rule of my kingdom over to the reign of God. God's governance, his kingdom, has been in existence since the very beginning, since creation. I fulfill God's original intention for me by joining my kingdom to his, by turning my will, my decision maker, over to him. The greater that my trust is in him, the greater my kingdom will be united with his. The prophet Jeremiah teaches us this in his chapter 29. God is speaking, quote, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Unquote. The Apostle John teaches us the same truth in his first letter. This is John's description of abiding in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 2 of 1 John, it says this, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Unquote. And then John ends his letter with this summary statement, simple and to the point. Chapter 5, verse 11. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. But now, there is a second step. The second commandment after love of God. Here, let me quote Dallas Willard again. God's intent is for us to learn to mesh our kingdom with the kingdoms of others. Love of neighbor, rightly understood, will make this happen. 
but we can only love adequately by taking as our primary aim the integration of our rule with God's. That is, that is why love of neighbor is the second, not the first commandment, and why we are told to seek first the, co the kingdom or the rule of God. Only as we find that kingdom and settle into it can we human beings all reign or rule together with God. We will then enjoy individualized reigns with neither isolation nor conflict. This is the ideal of human existence for which secular idealism vainly strives. Small wonder that, as Paul says, creation eagerly awaits the revealing of God's children. In other words, that's the end of the quote, in other words, it is only under God's governance that we can learn to live together, each in our own kingdom, and yet meshed together in such a way that we never are lonely or are never in conflict. This wonderful state of affairs has yet to come. We know that, and yet we pray for it. Thy kingdom come. Now let me repeat that sentence. We will then enjoy individualized kingdoms with neither isolation nor conflict. Willard is describing the ideal church community here, the body of Christ, his kingdom. You remember how Paul describes the church as being like a human body, each distinct part contributing its gift to the whole. Let's change the picture for a moment. Think of an organism with cells. Each one of the cells is each of our personal kingdoms. If a cell is isolated or leaves the organism, it dies. And if the cells are in conflict, warring against each other like cancer, then the organism dies. And yet within the healthy organism, each cell, each person, if you will, each kingdom maintains its own identity and its purpose, its significance, and serves the whole, the kingdom of God. That, you see, is God's original plan for us. Now, my friends, why did I call this, ser this sermon the stoplight? Because it represents to me a simple example of a community in agreement. We have agreed, almost worldwide, that a red light calls for a certain kind of behavior, a stop. If you do not honor that agreement, there can be terrible consequences both to you and to the community. If we willfully agree to obey the red light, we bring order and harmony into the community. And so on a much larger scale, if the world would willfully bring each of our kingdoms under the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, peace and justice might reign. We would all join him in an interactive responsibility for the welfare of mankind. You probably realize that such a divine kingdom assumes a communal trust in God. But as you know, we have mistrusted God and other persons from the beginning. That is what we call the fall. We feel we must isolate ourselves from God and seek our own individuality and our goals and also defend ourselves against an evil world. And yet, you know, deep down there is that longing within us to be part of a larger harmonious kingdom 
to lose our loneliness and our need to constantly defend our personal kingdom from the evil around us. The irony is we believe we can achieve this using the tools of the world, power, and material wealth, when in fact we could achieve it by submission to and trust in the kingdom of God. Sometimes I try to see the world as God sees it. Quite frankly, sometimes if I were him, I would give up and start out again on another planet. But he stands patiently waiting, knowing that in his plan, his kingdom is coming. So let me end with two verses of hope. At the end of Matthew in chapter 25, the Lord Jesus tells that incredible story of the sheep and the goats, of those who feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and then store that story, on the other hand, of those who do not. In verse 34, he says, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then at the end of the Bible, the very last chapter of Revelations, chapter 22, verse 5, John is describing the servants of God in his eternal kingdom, and he says, the Lord will be their light and they will reign forever and ever.